Um, okay. Is that recording? Okay, so on the commercial project, your main floor sits right on concrete. So the framing that we're going to do with everybody in the class for architecture three, that starts between your first floor and second floor. And the same thing between your second and third floor. Uh, is anyone in this class doing more than three stories? Cool, because then that changes the framing completely if we go taller than three. So that way we can all stay on the same page. So I'm going to start with architecture two between the basement and the main floor. And what I'm doing here, architecture three will be doing between the first floor and second floor. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, hopefully not too confusing. It's a little bit wild, but it works. Okay, now what I'm going to do is in your template, you should have in your structure plans, one that says uh, for architecture two, main level flooring and for architecture three, two, or sorry, three, it should be um, upper level flooring or second level flooring. So figure out which one, oh God, that's kind of a big statement, right? Figure out where you're supposed to go and go there. Um, I hated that when teachers told me that. I wanna go with my friends, but you did this alphabetical, so I'm gonna go over there with people I don't like, and uh, I don't wanna go there. Okay. Teachers still do that? Not, not during COVID, right? We can't do group seven. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna jump down to the main level floor framing. Architecture three, you're going to upper level floor framing. And whatever you've named that system. Right? Now, when we get into here, it's gonna be a little odd um, because it will show um, everything down to the structural levels for architecture two. Architecture three, you probably won't see your footings. If you do, don't be discouraged by them. Okay, they can get a little confusing when you see all these walls. So I'm going to zoom up on this wall a little bit and see if we can identify it. So on the foundation plan, the outside are my footings. The next level is the foundation. And then the final two here, that is the wood stud. So this has a brick finish on it. So if you kind of just float over them, and think about how you're building your building, it can kind of make a little bit of sense to you what levels you're seeing. Uh, if you click on it, it will then tell you if you need a little help. Uh, that's always a good thing to get some help once in a while. Um, so you kind of know where you're at. So you know, we've got some different levels going on in here. When we talk about framing systems, the idea is to distribute the weight of the building out to the footings and then into the earth itself. Now, the question comes up, in my more philosophical college courses, if we build a house, does that make the earth heavier? No. The answer is yes. yes. It's yes. Because when we take things like sand and gravel and we make them more dense by turning them into concrete, we've increased their weight. The mass has not changed but the weight has, whoa, that's kind of trippy, right? So because weights are not a subject of gravity, so don't worry about it too much. It's so negligible, it doesn't matter. Okay. The other question you want to ask about Earth is, if we all walk in the same direction, can we change the direction of spins? Hmm. No, because we're on a sphere, that means you'd have to get everybody lined up on the Earth equator to make that happen, and there's not enough room in the equator for everybody. Deep thoughts. Nothing going there. Okay, fine. Not only that, you would displace the if you like got it to move enough, you displace the stuff. Yeah. Because it floats. Exactly. Yep. Good. Let's see, there's a deep thinker. We like deep thinkers. Okay, because you have to do some deep thinking today. Okay. Mm -hmm. Deep thinking is really important. So I'm gonna take this plan here, and it could be a commercial building, it could be a residential building. What I see here on the screen, it doesn't matter. Okay. What we have to do is start understanding what we're doing to it. So I'm going to mark this up a little bit, primarily because there's enough people not here today that um, it gets a little crazy. So I cannot span this entire width for anything. It's too wide. So going horizontally is not an option through the midsection of this project. 
up here on the wings, piece of cake. That would be probably no problem whatsoever. So what I have to do is divide this out into smaller chunks that are doable, okay? So let me just stop here for just a minute and do some measurements. Um, measuring is gonna become really important for you because you probably don't have um, everything stuck in your head. So let me get my little handy dandy notebook. And with that, I'm gonna make some notes, um, at least from my thinking. And I'm just gonna use the measure tool. So one, I need to know approximately the distance across. So I've got a 25 foot eight space. So I'm gonna write that down at that area. Uh, I'm gonna take another at the larger depth. So you know where I'm at, that's about, and I'm not getting exact. Uh, let's swing it about 32 feet. That's good there. Let's go the other direction on the other end. William, William, William. Okay. So here I'm only going 28, 20 foot eight. And then they go horizontally with the distances. So across here, mm, 10, that's cool. And then coming down across here. And I'm already starting to say, wow, this is not a really well thought out plan. Actually it was kind of, kind of, kind of is a big term. Kind of is what you do when you want to sort of safe face, going clear across here, 52, not even worry about that number, that's not even realistic. Going across here, 30. I'm gonna put 10, I'm gonna put that in there. And I'm just getting distances about width in 18.2. Okay, so that gives me an idea. Now, what I want to do is frame this out of wood. Now, commercially, I definitely could do it all out of steel. But unfortunately, a steel is more expensive than wood and it's heavier. So if I'm doing a small dorm that's three stories in height, I wanna limit the amount of steel that I'm using. One, um, steel tends to vibrate uh, sound, which um, can be a detriment in a dorm situation, unless you coat it in like um, concrete or gunite to deaden the sound because they tend to have metal, you got harmonics involved. Um, it's to the expense of getting it to the site. Usually when we build a dorm uh, for a college campus, it's probably a piece of green space that has been allowed to be turned into building space. So that means we've got to get beams in between existing buildings. It can be done, but we have to get very large cranes to do that and those are expensive. So again, keeping cost in mind always is what we look at. Residentially steel, is cost prohibitive. Usually in a residence, you might have one steel beam in the entire house. So that's usually over the garage door. So if you go with a garage door that's greater than 16 feet, you tend to end up having to put a steel beam in there. Now you can do it with wood, but you've got to get a contractor willing to get enough people on site to do that. With a beam out of steel, it's delivered and put right in place. So it's never on the ground because they order it and time it just right. So this goes right on the wall where it goes. With a wood beam, it's delivered with all the other wood. So then you've got to have the crew on hand to put it into place. And that's not a difficult thing. It takes usually about six guys. Uh, and we're gonna look at those beams today. I prefer wood beams for a lot of reasons. One, I can expose them, meaning I can bring them down below the ceiling. I can use them as an architectural feature so I can stain them, I can paint them. I can even do um, different type of cuts into them and make them uh, have molding shapes to them. And so there's a lot of these things that go to the back of your head. Um, what you'll learn over time, um, hopefully, is that wood floor joists max out at 22 feet. That's where you max. Now I've got a space here right down through here, that's 32 feet. I've got this space here is 25 foot eight. Um, I've got another space going right across here. And in this area horizontally, that's 30 foot 10. So I've definitely got some issues of how I'm gonna frame this floor. If I leave an open uh, basement plan uh, or my open floor. Now you can use walls as bearings. Okay, so if I have a bearing on this, I'm gonna to jump to the basement plan here real quick. Um, so if I choose, and this is typically how I would go about looking at a house, 
I would look at walls that make sense to make into bearing walls. So for instance, this wall goes right down through here will be a natural bearing wall. That wall, if I remember right, is only 10 feet over, 11 feet, 12 foot, something like that. Okay, that means that's a natural bearing point. Now, if you put the wall in, and I'm gonna throw this wall in so you can see what I'm gonna do here, because I'm doing this for those of you who are not here today. And if we go to review it, I'm gonna to go to my interior two by four partition wall, and I'm just gonna bring that wall down. Now, typically, I really don't like corners that don't have a purpose for being a corner. Uh, that's just not my thing. And where I don't have anything on this side, I'm gonna bring it off of that corner where the fur furring comes out. So you can see where I'm pulling that from. Because if I can hide those corners, it's a lot easier on the drywall. So that makes it cheaper. Anytime you can make things easier by the way they look, it makes it cheaper. And I really want you guys to have part of the American dream. I want you guys to be able to afford a house. And so I got myself on a whole bunch of extra committees this year, and uh, it's about finding more affordable housing for people. Okay, so I put that wall in. It's on the basement. This has now become a bearing wall. At this point, it's not a bearing wall until I go into the 3D mode, and I flip this house upside down. Kind of. When you find the house, that'd be great. Now in there is I just did that wall. I can't see that wall. You can see part of it coming right through there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select my floor, hopefully. I'll just do it. Sometimes the things you want to do quickly, it won't do quickly. Isn't that great? Okay. So how do I do it quickly? We go into the section view because it's just faster. Um, I'm going to take my concrete slab here and I'm just going to hide that in the three of you. So I'm going to select it here and hide it here. Okay. Now there's the wall that I just put in. You then need to do that, remove that floor in order to do what we're about to do. In order for this wall to be a bearing wall, holding up the floor framing, it must have a footing underneath it. So I go into structure. I go into my wall foundations. And again, it's gonna be your 10 by 20 uh, for residential. Commercial folks use the 12 by 36 because you're gonna be carrying the weight of whatever goes on those dorms as well. And what we wanna do in dorms um, especially is plan on the kid that's a little more privileged than they should be. Um, meaning they bring in their own water bed or they bring in other stuff that's not usually found in a dorm. Um, gun safes, one of those things that show up in dorms, surprisingly. Uh, large fish tanks, usually full of piranha if it's a guy's dorm. That's a pretty common thing to see show up. Um, you can buy piranha at the pet store. Um, they're freshwater fish, so um, college is great. It's great. Oh, you should go to college just for the experience. So I just gonna put a footing underneath this. As soon as I do that, it is now a bearing wall, okay? So super, super important. Now, while I'm looking up here upside down, the walls that are, on, that are around your stairway are also bearing walls. They need a footing underneath them. So when you put the walls around your stair, and I haven't done that on this one yet. Boy, that's a very Escher stair going on there when you look upside down. It's kind of trippy. The walls around your stair would get bearing footings as well, okay? They have to be bearing. And why do we make those stairs? Bearing, what's the big deal with stairs? Last thing to fall apart in the house. we got to get people out, okay? Especially in the dorms, make sure they've got footings underneath them, okay? Now, if I go back to my lower level, there's a footing underneath there now. Um, it's all well and good, and that's a bearing wall. That takes care of one of my problems, okay? Just takes care of one. Now, I'm going to switch back over to my framing here. And all you see is the footing. Isn't that nice? The structure plans are so helpful. Now, why do I not see the wall here? That's a question you should be asking yourself. We put a wall in, we can't see it. Why can't we see it? Think carefully. Any ideas? Okay. And that's fine if you don't have an idea. Um, we'll get you there. It's not designated as a structural wall. It's just a wall. So we'd have, if we wanted that wall to show here, we'd have to go into structure, go in the wall, go to our two by four, and 
match the dang wall. And I got to make sure I change, oops, got to change my setting there a little bit. Sorry about that. Uh, I want to make sure I draw it with the same intensity and get that line in the right place. So you just match the wall. And it also means you've got to match the height. And something's going a little weird here right now. Up to. You selected the wall. Did I? Thank you. I took out why I could see it. I'm getting old, people. I'm getting very, very old. But I'm not old enough yet. I'm going to live forever, so it doesn't matter how old I get, right? So the base, again, is going to be off of your lower level floor line. Um, is what we're looking for. Or your basement, depending on what you've named it. Basement there. And up to your main level floor line. I don't think I grabbed the right one, but that's okay. And then just trace that wall. Now, this wall will only show in the structural level and not in the floor plan level, okay? So if you need a wall, you can go through and do that, okay? And I got the wrong basement because um, I don't have a basement. I have a lower level. I get so nervous when I record a lesson. I don't know why that is. Why did I have a lower level in this thing? Hmm. Huh, that's interesting. Crazy. Got a mistake in there. Okay, we'll just go back. So we got this wonderful wall, okay? Um, that's if you want to make walls. Now, what if it, and then you can just put your framing in. So framing is our next thing we're going to look at. I'm going to look at framing right down the strip. Because this is bearing, and this wall is bearing, I can go ahead and put all that framing in right away. Now, what you got to be careful of is recognizing where you're at. So you're going to still be in the structural level on the structural plan. Very important you put them here. Okay. Go into the beam. And you have in your setup a, few, a couple of beams that are already there for you. One is you have a plywood web joist, which we generally call a TJI. They're built originally by Boise Cascade out of Boise, Idaho. Um, I want to talk about that history, but Boise Cascade was purchased, uh, actually uh, Boise Cascade was purchased by Trust Joyce McMillan and they were purchased out by Weyerhaeuser. So that company's been sold a few times in my career. It will probably be sold again. So currently it's owned by Germans. Um, so when they talk about China buying all of the United States, and that's not true. Germany owns the Northwest. So it may have flown to Seattle, Portland, um, Spokane, flown over the forest there. Okay, so we have that. Okay, we fly over, it looks very much like a farmed uh, acreage of corn, where you have trees at different heights in large square chunks. We farm our forest in the north northwest very, very, very carefully, uh, which is why when we have forest fires, we don't have them in the northwest the way we have in California. So California has a forest fire and the whole world's in trouble, right? Uh, especially this last year, we lost 2.5 million acres of forest in California. Um, whereas in, in, we have fires in Oregon and Washington, I don't know, we have fires that are all the time, but we don't lose that much acreage. What is the difference? Why is the Northwest is better than California with fire control? Any ideas? They're on rows, partially. Um, we try and randomize those plantings, but yeah, they're kind of in rows. Types of trees. Types of trees. Um, kind of, we still have this, there's a good mix there, especially between Oregon and California, we get a kind of common tree mix there. So what it is, it's the fact that we manage the forest. So uh, here, especially in Utah, when you go and walk through the forest, you see dead fall trees, right? You, to call them, and you come back uh, next year and they're gone. So in Utah, when you need firewood, you can get a permit from the Utah, uh, what is it called? U.S. Fish and Game Department to go in and harvest deadfall trees for firewood. And it's cheap. It's super cheap. And the good thing about that is those trees are already dried out. So you don't have to cut them and store them for four years for and use them. So we, we allow people to come and collect that. California does not allow that. Um, the other thing is, is um, we have crews that are hired in the summer. You have to be 16 to be on these crews. Uh, you are gone for the entire summer. 
and your job is literally to clean the forest. You go through and you cut down shrub brush that's not in the right place, that's uh, dead growth, you cut that all out, you clean the forest. And we do that because it controls fire. Now, do we want to stop fire? No, the forest has to have fire. Uh, most of the species of uh, trees we have here in the West require fire to germinate. So we've got lodgepole pine and white pine that will not sprout unless they've been exposed to about 1200 degree fire. They just won't. So we need fire, but we want to control it. Okay, so that's all that we control by not having dead stuff on the ground. That's how we do that. Um, so if any of you are looking for work, um, the Department of Agriculture will be hiring both uh, forest cleaners and tree planters this summer. Um, both are really well paying jobs. You are gone all summer though. Um, they do pay very, very well. And uh, your room and uh, food and room is provided while you're gone. So if you're looking for something like that, you can look into that. It's a pretty cool um, experience. Uh, you learn a lot about um, the world that we use daily. Okay. All right, so you have that. You also have in there an LVL. That's a different type of wood. Now, LVLs are uh, laminated veneer lumber, which means the inside of the wood is not the same as the outside of the wood. Uh, they're basically a giant plywood. And we use those for things like the rim joist that goes around the perimeter of the house. Uh, we use it for stair treads. Uh, it's just got a lot of purposes. We can also use it for headers over doors and windows. And so we want to make sure we have those in place to make things happen like that. Now for what we're doing, we want to probably use the 11 and 7 eighths uh, architecture three. If you want to use the 14 inch uh, in order to get more uh, duct work into your floor to provide more heating, uh, you might need to do that um, to get more plumbing in there because you're doing a lot of your dorms have multiple bathrooms, so you need to make sure there's room to put the plumbing in so it all connects. Uh, so you might want to go to a 15, 14-inch. Uh, just gives you a little bit of room, but you do have to adjust your floor heights in your elevations if you do that. Okay, so the floor heights that are given in your elevations are set for 11 and 7 eighths. So you need to add in the difference. Just raise each floor up a little bit. Make sense? Victor's looking like, what the freak are you talking about? You mean to show you? Okay, let's show you what that means. So you need a calculator to make this all work out well and good. So let's get a little calculate because one, I'm, I'm getting a little foggy, both my glasses and my head right now. So what I want to do is take 14 and minus 11.875 to get the difference. So the difference is two and an eighth of an inch. So two inch, two and one eighth of an inch. Yay. Okay. So I need to know that. So then I go into uh, any of the elevations, say the front elevation, and I come down to where my second floor begins, and I look at where my next floor is, my level 18 here that I've got. You simply go and click on the height, and you would add two and an eighth of an inch. Now, this is going to be kind of weird. So you get that eighth of an inch in there, and that's what you're raising it up to. I did feet. Dang it. That was not right. Stupid teacher. Pay attention, child. 2.125 inches. Okay, that's all you're adding. Just raise it up a little bit. And so you get that distance in there. Okay, that work, Victor? Okay, cool beans. Happy day. Now, going back here, um, I know uh, that I can do a TGI across this span really easily. Again, to remind you, I'm spanning from one side to the other. It's about 12 feet. It's a, they're bedrooms. They're pretty small. Okay. Some of your dorms, this is why we can do wood framing in your dorms. Um, is there a reason why we'd want to do concrete floors in all the floors on a dorm? Probably not. Um, one, the cost to build that dorm, it goes up exponentially when you do that. And it's really hard to insulate concrete. So we can insulate between the floors that have the dorms on them with wood a little easier, okay? So what I'm gonna do here is I need to know what my spacing is. So here we go, this is the hard part. I always wanted the hard part, right? Okay, it's gonna require a little Google work here. And so I'm gonna pull it up and then you can go find it. What it is is you're looking for, if you just do a TJI span chart, 
it'll take you to the warehouser.com link and that's where we're at. So if you just do Google search TJI span chart and then find the warehouser.com link It'll bring this up. And that brings us to Trust Joyce. And it's now Trust Joyce Warehouser. It used to be Trust Joyce McNeil. And before that was Trust Joyce Boise Cascade. Um, those charts are all still around. Um, they don't change a great deal. That's the good thing about engineered lumber is we can use it lots and lots. Okay. Everybody find it that's looking for it? Sure, a lot of clicking. But that's okay. I understand. Just as long as you'll be able to apply what we're doing here. Okay, so... We have on the first page here, it talks about TGI 110, TGI 210, TGI 230, TGI 360, TGI 560, and TGI 560D. Okay, these are big, 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 big things. Okay, these are the different series of engineered floor joists. And if we look at the picture, we can see that they're primarily made out of particle board. Particle board is what's shaved off of a log to make it square. So, and not including the bark. We don't use the bark because bark's non-structural. But we strip the bark and then we have to make it square so we can cut lumber from it. Well, all that scrap gets put together into particle board uh, sheets that we um, can make into plywood. Um, the top bottom pieces, so the middle piece here is called the web. The end pieces that make it look like the letter I are called flanges. Okay, so if you remember friends, you guys are all kind of friends. I think your generation's kind of found friends. We don't want to get confused with flange. Okay. Spelled the same way. So these are flanges. Once you get to the 360 series, they're not made out of plywood anymore. They're made out of two by fours. So they get pretty beefy. They're pretty strong. But right now, the lower series, the small numbers up through 230, are just out of plywood that's cut to shape. If you go down to page seven, and I'm going to beef this scale up here a little bit so you can see a little better. Okay, you're looking for page seven has on it the floor span tables. These are essential for your uh, long term viability, meaning if you use these charts, the house is not going to fall in on somebody. The dorms are not going to fall off and kill someone. Um, did you hear what happened? It's about people falling. Did you hear what happened in the news last night? Down in San Diego, someone decided they'd had enough of COVID and for whatever reason decided to take their own life, and which is their choice, right? They have that choice, but they landed on a lady and killed her too. Uh, yeah, way to go, huh? Uh, so, um, you know, look before you jump, but don't jump, for crying out loud. Um, so I find that kind of humorous, but kind of morbid, too, so that's my humor. Um, we don't want buildings to fall on people. It doesn't happen. Yeah, it does. So back in 18, oh, 18, 19, well, it was 1986, I remember this so well because Debbie Gibson was all the rage, and, you know, she was just saying, I think we're alone now somewhere. And she was, and her fame, both her and Tiffany, did not do the standard concert circuits. They broke the mold and did all of their concerts in malls because they knew what the target audience was and they knew where the money was and it was in teenage girls. And so she was in a mall in Michigan. Yeah, Michigan. And so many people showed up that they were crowding the upper balcony of the mall, kind of like fashion play small has this upper level. There are so many people up there, it couldn't hold the weight and it collapsed. And 80 teenagers died listening to, I think we're alone now. That's another one of those things. We have to be aware that we cannot anticipate what's gonna happen to a building ever. So we have to be safe in what we're doing to keep it as around as long as we want. Now for a dorm, a dorm will probably have a lifespan of 40 years. Um, BYU just changed and remodeled all of their dorms two years ago. Um, it's pretty common on campus housing for that to change out because they do get pretty beat up. Uh, a house should last 200 years. Okay, so that's kind of the way we're looking. So typically in a commercial application, if it's a store, 
or a gas station. Gas stations have a lifespan of 15 years. And then they turn into something like a wing nuts and then they turn into a checker auto and then they turn into something else. They don't stay their original form. Um, so we just watch our buildings change. It's, it's a rough life. So let's take a look at what we can do with our span. We go 12, we're going 12 feet in this case. We are going to use an 11, seven eighths and we have two sides to the column here and there's two charts. Okay, so let's talk about which one we want to use. If we take a look, and I want to get on the screen that you can see both. Let me do that. And I'm going to get my handy dandy marker out here. Okay. So if we look at the nine, nine and a half, 110, and look at the 12 inches on center, you'll see that that will span 16 foot 11. If we look at the same thing down below, nine and a half, 110, 12 inches on center, we'll see a two foot difference on that. So when we're sizing, if you want to kind of make things work, we use the lower chart. But to be safe as a designer, we use the upper chart. So I would use this value because it says I can do 16 feet. That works for my application at this point, but it also lets me know that if the contractor's got the wall off a little bit from where I designed it, and they can be off by as much as two feet and I'm still safe. That's what that's telling me. It is 16 and 18, that's a two foot difference. If the wall isn't exactly right, it's not gonna collapse. So this one is my safety zone. So this is my safe factor, okay, the one below. So that lets me know what I can do, and this is what I should do. Okay, does that make sense to you? So that's kind of the difference between those. Right. Any questions on that before I move on? It's a little bit weird to look at two charts, getting the same information, but being different, but I know. Okay, we are using an 11 to 7 eighths. We're using our should use zone. We need it to span 12 feet. Well, everything on this chart will span 12 feet. So now your next thing is, is once you know your span, the span's always the stuff in the middle here. We now need to decrease the number that we need. So we have 12 inches on center. So every 12 inches is a floor joist. We can go 16, 19.2, or 24. 24 is your most economical. 16 is your most common. Okay, so that's kind of the way this works. Now, the, what happens is, is if you don't have a thick enough subfloor, so I've made you use the 5 eighths uh, for the um, commercial and the three quarter for the uh, residential. Half inch is allowed by the code. And if you use a half inch subfloor, it will bounce. If you're at 24 inches on sale, you'll have bouncy parts to it. So that does not make a floor last very long. So you want to make sure your flooring is thick enough to control uh, the span. So the span does affect that a little bit. So if I go 24 inches on center, that means I can span 17 foot five. And so that's fine, I can do that. Uh, you can be more conservative and say, well, geez, I'm just gonna go 16 inches on center because that is the standard and I don't wanna break the standard. I wanna be normal like everybody else and that's fine as well. Okay, we're gonna do more complicated ones in just a minute. So this is a simple one. So give you a look at that. And I'm gonna go clear that out. Let's say, okay, no. So I'm gonna do 11, seven, eights. And I'm gonna go kind of mid-range of this. I could go with a 110. This is the, they, the price increases as you go down the chart, okay? So the 560s are your most expensive, the 110s are your least expensive. And it's just because the amount of material that's in them. It has nothing to do with their strength, it's amount of material usage, okay? So if I go 110, um, I'm still well within my 12 foot reach that I have to go with. So a span is anywhere that it sits on something. So if there's a wall in the middle, that's a span, okay? Okay, here we go. Back to um, my little drawing then. So now I'm gonna go in and get my beam, cancel that. I'm gonna use the 11 and three quarter and 11 to seven eighths, sorry, TGI. I want to span from the edge of the wall and 
usually you'll have one pretty close to the wall. Uh, just eyeball it. Don't try and measure it. That's just crazy. But do look at where you're at, okay? Make sure you're at the level you want. So architecture three, this is really going to apply to you. Make sure you're not on the top of the foundation. It's going to be way down below your ground. Make sure you're on the above the top plate to the main floor. Main level top plate is where you should be at on yours. That, and some of you have a different template. So either that or um, go to the second floor. If you don't know what that is, then we'll have to move them down separate. Okay. So make sure you know where you're placing these because they are all based off of the footing, wherever your footing is, not where your floor is. They're all based off your footing. So if we don't change this, we have them all over the place. Now on these, because these can be used for roof rafters, it gives you a start and an end height. So I could start it at 10 feet and the end of it be at 30 feet and it'll be at a slope. And I would just figure the trig to figure out what that height is, okay? Um, so make sure they're zeroed out. Uh, if you have to adjust it, this is what you adjust. And you want to adjust the first one before you do any others. Okay, and I'm gonna show you that here too. So once I get, comfortable with that, I just come on and I draw a line right across the wall and place it there. And I'm just going to call that good. So there's my, my floor right now. Just sits right there. Now, in order to see that it's in the right place, you're going to have to use a section cut. If you don't already have one, and I don't have a vertical one, I'm just going to put a vertical cut right here. So I'm cutting through that floor joist, and then I'm going to go to that view. And there is the floor joist I just drew. Okay, now notice there's a gap here. This is the floor spacing. Uh, this is where the mud seal goes. Then I've got the framing, and then up above is where the subfloor, which is granite finish floor goes. So it's all in here, but this one I want to take, let's take a look at what I did here, so remember. I've got a three quarter inch OSB board that's included in this. Okay, does that make sense? So you see that in the note? So I've, I've mapped that out already. I don't want this up underneath my carpet. It'll be very bumpy. And if you play with your low cars, you, blah, 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 blah. you don't want to do that, okay? You make part of the big dad jokes. And those are really bad, but here we go. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna select this joist. I do it with the first one, so I don't have to do it to all of them, okay? And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you what happens when these are gone wrong. I need to drop this down three quarters of an inch in my situation. Yours might be five eighths of an inch, okay? Yours might be nothing, depends what you've done with your settings. So I come into the start point and I'm gonna put in, and this is a wipe the whole thing out. It's always better when you do text. I notice a lot of you, do the backspin, backspin. That's really not efficient use of your time. Highlight the whole blooming thing. Put in what you want. It's much, much quicker. Okay, very much quicker. Now I'm going to do the start point and apply that. And we see that right here, the section, everything looks well and good. Okay, so keep that in mind. I'm going to jump now to my lower level. And I'm going to move this up. To where that is, I'm going to go to that view. Which one right here? This guy right here. This is my floor joist. What was that? Let's hide this. And there is my element. And I'm going. Wow! Well, I can't can't see that at all. So let's go and move it into that mode. So you can see that for that joist. So what I did is I went from um, coarse to fine. So I have the detail. Now I rose this guy up at the start. It's up three quarter inches of, or down three quarter inches from the other one. So if I look here and I come over here doesn't look a whole lot different, right? It should, but it's not. So you want to make sure that that's not enough span to really see a big difference there. From what I shifted it, in fact, it didn't shift at all. It's kind of sad. Did I change the wrong one? I did. 
Ooh, so bad. Change the wrong value. Bad teacher. Okay, it's all good. We'll make it work. Up here, the start level and end level is where I'm changing. Let me show you that there and do it right way. That's crazy. Making lots of mistakes. There we go. And I did not put the point in there. So we're going to put the point back in. Okay. When you do one end, you're going to get a slope to it. So, so, so 0.75 of a foot is nine inches, in case you didn't know that. There is a slope going on here. If you don't get both of these, they will, you start to copy these, they will magnify that difference, and you can actually get stairways going up into heaven if you're not careful. So, what you want to do is make sure you're working on the start ends, not the Z. Don't do a Z offset. And I almost did because I looked at geometrics and not the floor. When you start moving this stuff around, you will make a lot more work for yourself. And sometimes it's hard to delete those out because they go through your fridge, they go through your windows, and you can't get them. So be careful what you're doing there. So in this case, I want to drop the other one as well. So now it's back to being flush, and it's sitting on my wall where it should. There's a top plate there, and then my subfloor would go here. So I can start building this as it would be built. And then my detailing gets even better. And if I want, I can actually lengthen this and bring it over to the edge. And it can sit on your furring walls. It doesn't have to sit on your foundation walls. I would probably want it to. And if that's the case, I'd probably bring it over to about here. So I can start building what it's gonna look like. On the other side, same thing. I can stretch that over and get better length. So the section cut becomes your refining tool to allow you to fix things. Okay, I'm gonna go back to my level. So now that this guy is fixed, I'm ready to send it all the way down. Now there are a couple ways you can do this. Some are safer than others. I'm gonna show you the scary way first because I did not show this to the class yesterday. One, they won't do it right. I'm gonna trust you guys to pay attention to your settings, okay? In your modify, you have this linear array option, which will let you do the whole thing really quickly. You do have to have a steady hand. So if you're a very high caffeine user, um, just make sure you're not overdoing it the day you do framing, okay? So you click on the array, and I want to click this line, line right here. Now, as soon as I do that, and I finish that selection, I get all of my choices here. So what we're looking at here is when you look at these um, settings, it tells you it's just going to do the number of them. Well, I don't know how many I need. I need to know the spaces. So I click on the last, and I go from the first to the last. Oh, please give me the spacing. Do, 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 do. Um, this might not be working the way I want it to. Um, I want it to go a certain distance. Um, there we go. All right, so I get the um, associate grouping on there. And I want to go from the first to last. If I take this point and I go all the way down to where it's possible bottom is, if you get off and you're not at 90, this will be very, very bad. So before you click your OK tool, you want to make sure you've got that in there. And again, I need to know the numbers. So if my number is 42, how many times does, because I did these at 16, wasn't I? Okay. I don't know. Okay, so I've got 42 feet I've got to go. So I'm going to go ahead and use my handy dandy calculator because it's what it's for. Take 42 times 12. Then I'm going to divide that by 16 because I want these every 16 inches or 12 inches or 19.2 or 24, whatever your choice is. That tells me I need 31 and a half of these. You cannot do a half. Not possible. Um, so instead of doing a half, I'm going to do one more. So I'm going to put in 32. You can be less than your span, your spacing. So if you're spacing 16 and you're putting them at 15, you're okay. You're not going to get in trouble for that. So put in 32, come all the way down to the end, make sure it's at 90 degrees, make sure it's straight, and click, and they're done. Okay? But take 
go slow like I did to make sure everything's set the way you want it. Because if these go bad, they go very, very bad. They go really bad, really fast. And you could actually come up and over your roof and all kinds of things. Okay, the, if you're scared of that, uh, well, golly, what do you do if you're scared? Well, you take it one at a time. You go into your offset tool, you set it to 1.5 feet, which is 16 inches. You come down and you do them one at a time. And you keep going to get them all in there. So your choice, this is what yesterday had to do because they messed it up. So the array is much easier. And if you look carefully here, let me get this extra one out of here. I have two right here and then one here. Okay, kind of a weird little deal. So I'm just gonna take one out and I'm fine. They don't have to be perfect. The contractor is not gonna say, hey, um, I know you got two there, they're not. Um, what they're gonna do is, you know, read the note that says space with six size center, they're gonna do what I just did, measure the length and order what they need because they can't afford to go extra. There's nothing you can do with an extra floor dress. You can't make it into a picture frame. It doesn't make it into a wall board. It's, they're ugly. So no one wants extras, okay? All right, bigger problem, this area. I have this big open family room area in this place. It might be on the commercial plan. It might be your um, open uh, gaming area that you're doing, your retail space, and you want that open, okay? Well, if I can use a chart to figure out what my floor joists are, there's gotta be a chart for my beams and I need a beam chart. Well, fortunately, if you do a warehouser beam span chart, you'll get this. And that I, you can do a beam span chart and there's like 18 companies in the United States that do this. It doesn't matter what chart you use, okay? It really, really doesn't. You can use any of the beam span charts you find. They will work perfectly well, okay? Uh, I just happen to use this because it's the same company. And notice this guy has the Canadian flag. I'm not sure I feel about that, but that's okay. And let me get the other one here. It comes up right. And if we scroll this guy up here, it doesn't have a flag. So this is the one the Americans use. The other one's one the Canadians use. Warehouser is um, kind of slide that way. We get this symbol. This is the old Boise Cascades logo. So from way back. Uh, Boise Cascade is near to my heart. Um, they have a factory in my hometown. Boise Cascade now makes cardboard boxes. That's their thing. So they primary uh, their primary client is Amazon. They're making bank, making cardboard boxes. So keeps my family employed. All right. Um, actually, that's what my family's making. Guess what? Guess what? Not my family's making is going up here. My dad is a truck driver by profession. His side job is DNA. So we raise bulls, uh, but we do not have any cows. We just have bulls. And we sell their DNA to Argentina. Yeah, that's what we do. Okay, so in case you know, you cannot um, ship livestock across um, country lines, but you can send their DNA. Um, why do, uh, you don't care. We're going biology now today. Makes good beef though. All right, so I've got this big span here. I'm gonna measure it again so we remember what our value is here. So I need to span 26 feet with a beam. And um, beams come in lots of different types. Uh, we're gonna look at a few of them here. Get that a little bigger here. So beams, headers, and columns. Um, columns are vertical. Beams and headers are horizontal. Don't mix those up. Okay, they're considerably different. Um, what you're seeing here are the various types. Um, so this one right here is a, a veneer, laminated veneer. It looks like it's regular dimensional lumber, but on the inside it's particle board or plywood. Um, same with this one here. These are just oriented strand boards here. And it's oriented strand and all the layers are going the same way. In this case, what we do is we take all the chips of wood off the meal floor. We put them into a big pressure cooker of glue and then we mash it and they all line up. So it's kind of fun. Um, and then we get some of these up here. These, these two varieties right here, I like because when you stain them, they, they have, they're always unique. There's no two that are ever like when you stain them. So I like to expose this type of beam. 
these I usually paint because they just don't stain well. It's a cheaper uh, pine that's on the outside. But these guys, they look kind of cool when you stain them. Um, you can wrap them in, in finished uh, plywood or veneers, which looks a little better. Um, it gives you here on um, page, what changes this in two? It'll give you the basic sizes that they come in. And we can get parallams up to 19 inches deep or thick and up to seven inches wide. So these can be a really massive beam that looks like you built something back in the 1800s. Um, so they can be some very powerfully strong architectural elements in your building. Um, so let's kind of go through the differences. This one here is a laminated strand lumber, uh, the one that I like a lot, um, LSLs. LVLs are supposed to look like dimensional lumber, so they have the graining on the outside. I, again, they're not my favorite. Um, they're nice. Some people really like them. They're not my favorite. Uh, but I do use them quite a bit for headers um, because they just have a wood look and it. When the owner goes through, they don't freak out that the wood's a different color. So for some owners, that's a big deal. They look at all the studs and then they look at what's over the window door and they think something's wrong. So it just helps alleviate some stress. And right now people are really high stressed. I don't know why. Um, then there's the Paralabs. My very, very favorite is Paralabs um, PSLs. Okay, so let's look at the properties. This is for your engineer to use. <clears throat> but let's talk about just a little bit so you understand what's going on here. If you have a um, five and a half inch um, parallel right here, uh, and if you put it so that it is standing up on end, so plank orientation means it's horizontally laying flat, this in for is your moment of resistance. So when it stands up on end, it takes 4,000 pounds to bend it. Whereas if it's laying flat like a plank or a teeter-totter, it only takes 3,000 pounds to bend it. And I'm rounding those up, so kind of just like. Um, the shear factor is at 3,000 pounds, this one breaks and shears up, but it takes 8,000 to rip it apart. So that's the strength we're looking at here, 8,000 pounds of weight before it tears the fibers of the wood. And that, that's pretty impressive. Um, when it's all in there. It also gives the weight, this weight is per foot. So this beam here would weigh five and a half pounds per foot, basically. Um, pretty, pretty heavy beam, pretty dense piece of lumber. Very helpful. Okay, let's go. We got to get this thing, get your designs done. Uh, let's get to the span charts. Okay, so you have to decide which one you're using. And you get to choose that. Isn't that nice? And I will put these charts um, in uh, the course right after I'm done speaking here so you can access them. I'll post them as an announcement so you can download them easier. They'll be in as an attachment in that announcement. I would recommend that you save these and use them, especially them be working this summer for anybody. It'll make your life easier. All right, so if you're going to use an LSL, here's your chart is on page six. If you're going to use an LSL, your chart is on page seven. Get to my favorite here, micro lamb. This is the one I would probably end up using the most. Um, this is on page eight. So that's what I'm gonna use for this, this house, or this building, okay? Now, what you gotta look at is you might have to go through and you might have one you wanna use, but it won't meet your span. And my span that I've gotta get to is 30 feet which is a pretty good span. So my span is here on the left side in all of these charts. So this one, I know it's only go 20 feet. It's not an option, it won't work. This guy will go 28 feet, getting closer. This one's 28 feet. Oh no, maybe I'm not doing 32, oh, found one. Okay, so I had to get all the way down to where I can find the span that will work. Now you can break it up with walls. We just showed you that earlier, put a footing underneath it, make it a bearing wall, you can break that span. But I don't want to break the span in this case. Oh, I'm with my paralam, my favorites, okay? So I'm down here at the bomb chart, I need to go 32 feet, and now I gotta figure out the size. So if I use a three and a half inch wide, then I have either nine and a half inch deep, 11, 7, 8, 14, 16, 18, 19. If you want it to match your floor joist, you'll use the 11, 7, 8s. 
if you want it to be exposed in the ceiling line, you might want to use an 18 or 19 so it sticks down below your ceiling. That is the design choice that you make. They will all, pretty much all of these will match the need of what we're doing here. So if I, especially, well, the nine and a half inch one won't. He's, he's kicked out, he doesn't work. But from 11 over, that does. So I can look at these numbers and say, okay, what do I want to really deal with? I probably want to maximize my strength on this a little bit. So if I look at this column here, 11, seven, eights, uh, that's actually gonna work pretty well on there. <clears throat> so I've got a, a bearing, uh, sits on, it has set on the, has, what this means is here, the bearing point, it has to be on at least 1.5 inches of shelf has to be sitting on something that's at least an inch and a half thick. I can do that. Um, the factor on this one, uh, total resistance factor, 242,000 PSI. Uh, the unfactored resistance for live load and total load, that's gonna probably work pretty well for what I'm doing here. So this one's gonna work fine. So now I gotta go back up to the top and it's gonna be 11, three and a half inches by 11 and eight or I can go five and a quarter inch, which is basically a two by six situation and compare that one. Well, I can go I'm almost double, well, not quite double. So I get a lot more strength out of that one. And so if, you, if you're at all worried, thicken the beam, okay? If you're worried at all that you might not have enough strength, put a thicker beam in because you're gonna have an engineer review this. And if they say, oh my gosh, that's overkill. You're gonna make this thing a fortress. If that's your intent, then great. But if he says you can go back a little bit, let the engineer make the call. If the engineer changes the size and brings it back down, you have a record of it being larger and you're then exempt from any court filings. It's all on the engineer. That's a really big reason why you hire engineers. Now, here's the real thing. If you guys go for an architectural degree, most of you will be have a bachelor's plus or a master's plus. Engineers are bachelors, they're four-year degrees. They're going to make more money than you are, but they're taking a lot more legal risk because if they screw up, it's all on them. And especially if you have records that you've kept that says, hey, this is the size I wanted. The engineer said it was overkill. He's the one that stamped it. It's his license. You let that go because you, and if you want to fight with it, you're welcome to make the argument. There's a lot of tension between architects and engineers typically, uh, but stand your ground. Don't let them hurt your reputation but definitely don't take responsibility for their work, okay? So five and a half by 11 and eight. So let's put that one in. Go back to my plan. And I'm just gonna run a beam right through here, okay? So then go back into structure, back to beam. And I look in my list, I'm looking for a parallel, and I've got dimensional lumber, I've got LVLs, and I've got plywood. Huh, plywood web joists. None of those don't work. So. We go to edit type, go to load. In our library, go down to get to structural framing. So there's a whole bunch of structural stuff here we did not use in the other classes. So go to structural framing, go to wood. And let's see what we got. We got dimensional lumber, glue lamb, uh, southern pine, western pine, LVLs, plywood, timber, TJL open webs, TSL open web. So our what we're looking at here is a glue lamb. A parallel lamb is kind of a generic glue lamb beam. All glue lamb means is we took different wood and glued it together. So whether it's a parallel lamb or whatnot, that works. Now for choices, southern pine versus western pine, we use spruce in the west. They use um, Douglas fir or larch in the south. It's just a matter of if you want the wood shipped in or not. Um, they both have the same strength characteristics um, in physics math. Doesn't matter what one you use. I'll probably just use the Western because it's what we are. We're in the West, might as well be West. Hit open. And now you can go and get your size. So you want to find, oh, yeah, these are not going to be easy to get to the exact size. So I want five and a quarter. Not see, five and a quarter. 19, 15, 12. The five and a quarter, 12, um, these are rounded up values. So the, the 12 inch is 11 and 7 eighths. So they're a little bit rounding on there. Just get kind of close, you'll be fine. Uh, 
So I'm going to go back. This has eight lamenta lamentations to it. So eight different things make it up. So don't worry about that. It's just how it looks in your drawing. But just get it kind of close. And then we hit OK. Hit OK. And then I just run this beam um, right from my wall. And I'm just going to eyeball here and send it all the way across. OK, so there's a beam. Now, if you want to go with a three and a half, you can put two of those in. Um, oftentimes, I'll do that because sometimes it's cheaper to do two three and a half than one five and a quarter, eight. Um, you can just go in and do an offset. And usually, if I'm doing offsets, you want to go the thickness of the material. So I'm going to go three and a half here and make sure it's inches, not feet. That would be bad. And I'm just going to do an offset just to show you. The thing about offsetting your beams is they stand out on your drawing. So we know it's a beam and not a floor joist. So if you do an offset, just put two in, um, just so it's a symbology that there's a beam there, your drawings will look nicer. It doesn't, you don't have to put two there physically, but if you show two, it reads better on the blueprints, okay? And then you would run your floor joist between here. I'm gonna run one floor joist so you can see what's gonna happen there because you need to see some crazy stuff going on here. It's really weird world. So if I take a floor joist, I'm gonna run from this side over to this wall here. And I'm gonna do the offset method here real quick, just because um, I want you to see that in real time. Um, I don't know why you need to, but you do. And I want you to watch what happens is there's a gap here. I want you to watch what happens as this thing moves up. That goes up. Everything looks the same on both sides. And we get to here. Oh, let's exaggerate that. Okay, so looking here, notice how these end tips are hanging over more than these. Okay, do you see this difference here? These are sitting on the foundation wall. These are hanging from the beam. Okay, so that's a little bit different than what you would normally see. So I want to show you, um, see if I can get that to happen real quick, what that looks like, see if you can visualize it. Uh, maybe. I used to have pictures and everything. It's not so good anymore. Um, boom, 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 boom. Okay, so what that is, is so here's the beam right here. And then here's a Simpson strap. They're called straps, just like straps on a saddle. The TGI sits in that strap. And so they're flush the bottom of the beam and flush the top. So everything stays level, keeps your ceiling up. So these are Simpson straps. And when there's a gap, that's what it shows. Okay, so if this line here uh, if I was to raise that up or lower it down so that the line went over the other side, and it won't here because of what it is. Um, if the line sit on top of the beam, that means the beam's underneath the floor joists. Okay, so there's a very different there in how we show things. So just kind of keep that in mind that we can adjust and change the position by how it shows. Okay, then I would do the same thing for wherever else I need a beam. So I've got the stair here. Again, walls around the stair are bearing. So I may very easily come back in and um, what is that doing there? The geometry's all. What is that supposed to be? Pull my whole thing apart there, dang it. Um, so when I do my next beam, I get my glue lamp here. I can bring it from the wall on the back of the stair and bring them down here because this is bearing. So I can post it there and bring those across. So I'm breaking up the space in order to make it so I can do the floor spacing that I need. Okay. Any questions on what you're doing as far as framing systems go? Okay, so you need to now put the framing in for your floors. Uh, you want to hopefully have that done in the next little bit. Um, that's kind of the goal today. So I'm going to stop our recording here because that is.